Thank you so much. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody excited about Jesus this morning? Anybody happy that God is still alive and well in your life this morning? Why don't you clap your hands like you're excited about Jesus? What a mighty God we serve. Yes, he is mighty. He is mighty. With your Bibles in your hands, we are going to jump straight to the word. And while you're getting your Bibles, I just want to reiterate and remind us of the homegoing service. Amen. Of Sister Claire Brown that will happen here this Friday. Amen. At 11 a.m. Um, I, I want to appeal to this congregation as best as possible. I know that it's a Friday and everybody can't make it, but as best as possible. Sister Claire has served this congregation for a long, long, long time. That beautiful, short, dark lady, Usher. Amen. Always faithful, always serving. And the best we can do is try and just spend even an hour. Amen. Friday morning as we encourage the family to be strong and to keep on keeping on. I too want to endorse the Family Life Conference that's coming up October. There she is. Amen. You would, can't miss her. You'd remember her. Amen. So as best as possible. Bishop, Bishop S.U. Thomas, God bless his soul, used to say, you don't have to know the person to support the family because you're not coming to the remains. You're coming to support the family that is still alive and need the support and bishop in his humorous word would say theo dear come too amen theo dear come too and when your day come you're going to need the whole congregation to show up well can i tell you if you want the whole congregation to show up you better show up in your lifetime because you know people have an interesting way of remembering things but as a family i'm just encouraging us to if you can as best as you can, please support the families um, of Sister Claire Brown. Family life coming up, we, we endorse that and we encourage the family to come on out. Um, very often, um, the programs that are planned, um, when you come sometimes, unfortunately, the people who need the information most are not here. Amen. And those who have it together, we just come and enjoy and be reminded but some of the people who need the information most, you are at home and then you complain sometimes and say the church is not doing. Let me tell you something. I don't know what more can we do. We have done our best to serve the congregation. Make use of the service given to you. We are in the book of Philippians chapter 2. It's the same text that was read this morning. Philippians chapter 2. I'll be reading in your hearing once again from verse uh, 12 to 14 of Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, and not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputing. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. And let me just greet all the elders, Elder Miller, Elder Dawkins, Elder Palmer, and all the ministers, amen, evangelists, missionaries. Good to see you. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. It's good to see you, everybody celebrating anniversaries and birthdays and all of that. God bless you. Matter of fact, speaking of birthday, Kame is among that group. Amen. Please, please stand, Kame. Please stand. and uh, Yes, turn around. Let them see your beautiful face. Praise God. Her birthday is coming up. I hope she has something special planned for me. Um, it's her birthday, but... <laughs> Amen. You may be seated. Praise God. Amen. I'm happy for my wife. Um, God is good. Today's message, it's time to work out. It's time.
to work out. Look at somebody and tell them it's time to work out. It's time to work out. It's time to work out. Uh, verse 12 said, uh, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. The instruction is in the last clause. Work out your own salvation. How? With fear and trembling. Paul was writing to the Philippians brethren as he admonished them how to live the Christian life. As he reminded them of the importance of personal accountability as it relates to their salvation and their walk with God. I will be talking to you uh, largely this morning um, on the text and I will be drawing a contrast between two concepts which sometimes appear to be conflicting but they're not. Amen. It's not one or the other. It is both. So I, I crave your indulgence Praise God, no fire and brimstone, at least in the first part of the message. Praise God, so please listen and follow and do not miss the lesson I intend to teach. Just before I teach it, I have a key. I almost forgot. Amen. God is still working miracles. Amen. Father, we lift up this key as a symbol of God or a reminder of your blessings to your people. I pray that the owner of this motor vehicle will be blessed. Hallelujah. And that no evil will befall. You said, God, in your words, that the blessings of the Lord make it rich and add it no sorrow. Guide and protect your servant. And Lord, while you're at it, those who are waiting, oh God, those who are waiting for their own motor vehicle, I pray in the name of Jesus that you open the windows of heaven and pour out their blessings also. We be careful to give you praise. Amen. Praise God. We are living in a time when the world is becoming more and more health conscious. Is that true? Yes. So it's common today where you see people uh, engaging in more healthy diet, uh, exercise and the awareness of rest seems to be the order of the day. There are new discoveries every day new discoveries are made concerning natural remedies for all sorts of sicknesses and diseases now that's a good thing that's a good thing quite recently i heard of a remedy that is good for pain the brother was talking about it and he said any ailment brother reed it good for it anything this one bush amen is good for it but Every day we discover new remedies for sicknesses and diseases and the world is becoming more health conscious. In every plaza, in every mall now, there is a health food store where you can go and get all your pecan and your chickpeas and all sort of bush grind up in a bag. You have to read to figure out what you're buying. Amen. But, but the world is becoming more health conscious. And... and I don't know that there is anything inherently bad or wrong about that because remember how God intended it from in the beginning is that it is the herbs that should be for the healing of the nation. Amen. And some of these synthetic drugs that we are using are actually not good for us. But I am no doctor, so I will say if you are on your medication, take your medication and trust God to get you off your medication. But a little mint and a little seracy is good. Amen. As a countryman, a little saucy perilla. Praise God. A little cheney root. Can I go on? I see a roots man over there clapping. <laughs> Please stand for me, brother. Please stand. Please stand. Yeah, yeah, there goes a roots man right there. Amen. Praise God. We're becoming more health conscious. And that's good. Another observation I have made concerning the times in which we are living in is that the world is becoming smaller the world is becoming smaller. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that Japan is any smaller, that a piece of it has been cut off, you know, not geographically, but we are becoming smaller through the advancement of modern technology. We have smaller and quicker gadgets and tools 
Praise God. You know, I was watching the other day and uh, landscaping, and they now have a machine. Praise God. You can wake up this morning with the front of your yard bare or the back of your yard, and by evening come, you can have a large oak tree in the back of your yard. Healthy green tree. Because of the advancement of technology, there is a machine that can go to the forest and it goes deep in the ground and it plucks that tree up with the soil, dig a hole in your backyard, plant the tree, and not one leaf will wither. Advancement in technology. You can sit here in Jamaica, wake up this morning with your fritters in your hand and join a meeting in Japan or in Australia. Speak to your co-workers. Amen. It's a global village, brethren. The world is becoming smaller. There was a time when we had to send telegrams and write letters and wait six months <laughs> for auntie to get that letter and to write you back one year before you get the $50 that you're begging. Lord have mercy. But nowadays, just a click away. A matter of fact, it gets so small that you can just face time auntie and you see what's happening in auntie's house the world is becoming smaller operations nowadays if you're sick and there is a tumor to be removed depending on which doctor you go you may not end up with a single scar on your stomach because there is a thing called laser where they can send a light inside of you cut away the tumor get it out and you get up and go home technological advancement the world is becoming smaller through modern technology and that's good it has its place nowadays you can go to church online zoom praise god you you don't have to go to california to join a convention you just zoom okay, online and you're there praise god well as a result of this the world is becoming, to an extent, more individualistic. So, uh, for some people on the job, it used to be a department where several of you are in uh, on a floor working together in a department. But because of technological advancement, now one man is doing five persons' job. And you're sitting in front of a computer all by yourself in your cubicle. You don't have to talk to nobody. You are at work on your own by yourself with your computer. Am I talking to anybody? I want you to understand that as a result of that, now we're becoming more individualistic. I can do this by myself. I don't have to talk to anybody. I just fix my business. I don't have to go to the bank. I sit with my computer. I go online. I move money from one account to the next without talking to a teller. That's where we are today. And we're becoming more one-on-one. -on -one. We are doing this by ourselves. Well, while all of that is happening, I have observed, and I believe you have too, the church, on the other hand, is to an extent becoming overly corporate in its approach. Hear me now. The church, to an extent, is becoming overly corporate in its approach. What do I mean by this? It would appear that we are more interested in a corporate move of God, where the whole church is boiling over under the anointing, where everybody is shouting and getting their blessings and their breakthrough through together, more than we are interested in a one-on-one -on -one shut in with Jesus, personal revelation and illumination, being taken to another place in your closet, in your room, wrapped up by yourself, over the wash tub, meditating upon the word of God, and God now visit you by yourself and drop a revelation in your spirit. It seemed to me that we are more interested in the corporate move than we are interested in a personal one-on-one -on -one with God. So the world is coming more one-on-one, -on -one, but the church apparently 
If we don't have 5,000 people, we measure our success based on the numbers. We measure our success based on the volume of the shout. I'm by myself this morning. But, but, but I didn't dress like this because I want to show off. The, the word of God said this morning, it's time to work out. But what are you working out? Your muscles? Oh no. The Bible said work out your own salvation. And there is a way that you ought to do it. With fear and trembling. What does this fear speak to? It speaks to reverence to God. Where you see God for who he is. Oh help me Holy Ghost. More interested in the corporate move. <laughs> I hereby submit to you brothers and sisters. That a corporate move of God in the church and by extension in the world is vital. Hear me. I did say in my introduction, it is not one versus the other. It is both. But we've got to find that place of balance. So, so this is vital to evangelism and the winning of souls. We need to go as a force. We need to operate as, as a corporate unit. Yes, it's vital to that. God is certainly interested in mass gatherings and corporate worship. So it is recorded in the book of John 3, 16 to show you how God is interested in a corporate move. The Bible said, for God so what love 5,000 people that he gave. Is that what the word said? No. For God so loved the world. Not speaking of the mountains and the oceans now and the valleys. He's speaking of people, the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth on him should not perish. He so loved the nations of the world that he gave his son for the world. So we are not anti mass gathering. We are not anti uh, a, a corporate move. It is also recorded in the book of Acts chapter 2. Peter Preached to the multitude after the initial pouring out of the Holy Spirit in the upper room. And so it is recorded in verse 40 to 47 of Acts. And with many other words, the word of God said, did he testify and exhort saying, save yourselves, save yourselves from this untoward generation here verse 1 41 then they that gladly receive his word were baptized and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls follow me three thousand souls one day added to the upper room experience and so by now you should know I'm not saying that we shouldn't go after the numbers and that we shouldn't come together as a body and that we shouldn't work together and you can help me walk this walk you can help me uh, to deal with the struggles every single one of us in this Christian walk we do have some challenges ouch every single one of us have some mountains barring none that we could do with a little encouragement sometimes. A sister stepped to me quite recently and just, just deposited a little word in my spirit. And I said, this must be God. Because that little word just encouraged me and lift me from a place. And it gave me a renewed sense of hope. Uh, she, she didn't come preaching to me. She didn't even say the Lord sent me. It was almost like a greeting. But she just dropped that little word. I'm telling you, every one of us, every now and then, we hit a low place in our walk with God. And all we need is just a little heavy sent word to encourage us am i talking to real people so so we need people but hear this when it comes down to your soul salvation it is an individual thing it is an individual thing the bible said in verse 47 of acts 2 they they, they were praising god and having favor with all the people and the lord added to the church daily do the math the lord added to the church talking about the acts church every day so watch this now those who went up to the upper room 120 and then 3000 
And then up on top of that, the Lord is now adding to the same church daily. Every day, at least one soul added. I'm trying to say God is big on the corporate move. But brothers and sisters, both biblical and secular history have shown that the success of corporate or mass ventures of whatever kind is built upon the fervor of one single individual who has experienced an awakening of some sort. Let me package that a little shorter for you. Every corporate move, the secular history has shown that, that it began with one person. In other words, it was the brainchild of an individual. This individual will open his mouth and call company. But if you trace the success of major world events, you will find that it began with one person. What am I trying to say? Oh, I believe it's Andre Crouch who said it only takes a spark to get the fire going. If we need corporate revival, it's going to begin with one soul. Uh, yeah, corporate revival is going to happen, but it is going to happen when we are revived at the individual level. You don't need the whole Sunday school to do it. One Sunday school student just needs to do it. And if each of us catch a fire and is now burning with the fervor of the anointing of the Holy Ghost, then corporate move is automatic. But it begins with one. Let's take a glance at the secular move where one person impacted the world. 1863 to 1947, Henry Ford was an industrialist who changed the face of automobile manufacture in America, becoming the epitome of American capitalism. He lent his name to Fordism. My God, efficient mass production of the motor car. Mr. Henry Ford. And some of you, if you're old enough, you had a Ford. Amen. Ford Cartina, Ford Escort. Yes, those old cars credited to one man who changed the way the world traveled. One man. It was his brainchild. We continue to look at some great men who one person, I'm telling you, a revolution starts with one. Come on, somebody say one, one, one. Come on, join me. Everybody say one. Begins with one. You look at the abolition of apartheid in South Africa. And quickly, Nelson Mandela's name jumped to your mind. One man. Yes, his brainchild. He didn't do it by himself. But it was his vision, his fervor, and his passion. That even when he was in prison, he was still orchestrating. Let me tell you something. When God called you and put a burning in your spirit concerning something that is great. It doesn't matter if you're in prison. It doesn't matter if you're sick in your body. It doesn't matter what kind of attack the enemy would put up against your life. The fire inside of of you even if you have to lie on your bed you will make a phone call and the will of God will be accomplished because one person decides that I'm going to work out my own salvation I'm going to work out what God has given me that which God has placed on my life must be manifested and even though sometimes I feel like I'm by myself I'm going to do it because there is a fire inside of me just like it was in Jeremiah when Jeremiah became so discouraged and Jeremiah said every time I open my mouth to preach concerning what you God gave me they want to kill me they're seeking my life Jeremiah said I'm not going to preach this anymore I'm going to sit down but when Jeremiah decided that he was going to sit down the fire the fervor that was in his spirit he said I can't sit down I feel like fire is shut up in my bone I come to challenge every believer that God has placed something upon and I believe I'm talking to all of you it may not be what he gave me it may may not be what he gave sister X but every one of us receive a commission from God to do great exploits in the kingdom of God whether it be public exploit or private exploit it is on you but too many of us are sleeping with what God has given you I come to tell you it's time to work out it's time to work out somebody hear me this morning it's time to work out we continue to look at some great men, Sir Isaac Newton. Uh, those of you who love the numbers, yes, Brother Lerone, you know exactly who that is. 1643 to 1726 was an English mathematician. 
uh, physicist and scientist. He is widely regarded as one of the most influential scientists of our time. Yes, a lot of our mathematical concepts must be accredited to Sir Isaac Newton. One man changed the face of math. We continue to look and we come a little closer in history. And I'm still in the secular. Uh, we look at Rosa Parks. And that name should mean something to you, especially if you are a black man like myself. 1913, 2005, helped initiate the civil rights movement in the United States when she refused to give up her seat to a white man on Montgomery, Alabama bus. Rosa Parks said, oh no, I I'll have no more of this. It is those times when as a black man you had to get up, you were not considered worthy enough to sit in a particular seat. There were restaurants in America where you couldn't go. You would see a sign, whites only. Lord have mercy. But can you imagine, it was not a man, it was a woman. Oh God Almighty. Just, just one look and she would fall over. You know what that those folks could have done to her? But there was a passion for human equality that was inside of the woman i don't i can't tell you it was it was it was uh, built upon the anointing of the holy ghost uh, but it was a fervor that said to her i am a human just like you and you're not better than me so that passion and that fervor inside of her as an activist said i will not get up even if it costs my life they could have talked took her up and threw her off the bus she said i'm not going and that one action by one woman sparked a revolution in the history of the world i'm trying to tell you that great things happen when there is fervor and passion in one so if you should look at it in order it is telling you clearly that a corporate move and a corporate revival begins with one we leave the secular and we jump now into that which relates to the spiritual one god started the nation of the earth with one follow me brethren yeah i spoke to you about the importance of the group the mass spoke to you about uh, god loving the world spoke to you about uh, how god added to the church daily uh, that's important we need both but the challenge and the pitfall is when we elevate the mass over the one because the mass is dependent on the oh god so god started the nation of the earth with one it was one man adam Praise God. We look a little further and we found out that God uh, spoke to Moses, one man, called him near to the burning bush and sent him to be a deliverer. Moses was so burned with fervor for his people and for the things of God that he saw the oppressor oh, oppressing one of his own people and the fervor and the passion that was on him as a leader caused him to take matters into his own hands and took out a guy. As a result of that, you know the story, Moses had to run for his life and ended up in training school out there in the desert where he would have to learn what service meant. Can I tell you something? When God anoint you and put things up on your life sometimes the path to affecting the multitude is not a straight path sometimes it's twists and turns you have to go up you have to go down you end up in a pit sometimes you end up with your own families turning against you sometimes but when there is a call and an anointing upon your life before you get to the mass you've got to learn to appreciate being the one but look at your neighbor and tell them it's time to work out what are you working out your own salvation so Moses now had to go to training school but when he came back the one man was able to stand in front of Pharaoh and do great miracles based upon the anointing that was upon his life I didn't hear Moses going down in prayer and fasting before he worked a miracle in the presence of Pharaoh when Moses said throw down your rod and and and, and the adversary now uh, in Egypt now throw down his rod and because of his black magic 
demonic authority that he had. His serpent, his rod became serpent too. Lord have mercy. But let me tell you something. When God is working on you, that which he has given you is bigger, it's better, it's more potent, it's more powerful, and no devil in hell can conquer what God is doing in you, with you, and through you. But it begins with one. You've got to have a commitment to work out your own salvation. The one man threw down his rod and the Bible said his rod became a serpent. The difference is that his serpent was bigger than the serpent of the enemy and it gobbled up Lord God Almighty and at the end of the day turned back into a rod in the hand of the man of God. God is bigger than your problems. He is bigger than your Egypt. He is bigger than that little serpent crawling in front of you. You tell me who can stand before us when we go in Jesus name but you've got to make a commitment to work out oh God Abraham was called one man Abraham was called out of his nation Ur of the Chaldeans and God said I'm going to change your name and at the time he didn't have a son God said I'm going to make of you a great nation that is why the scripture said brethren we walk by faith and not by sight he became the hero and the epitome if you don't mind a faith because God says step out he said make me a father I don't have any kid but God said I'm going to make a nation out of you some of us feel like we have passed our time but I'm telling you don't let go of that little flicker burning inside of you that fervor that vision that you have that vision that you see I know you feel you're getting old and that you've passed your time the devil is a liar every spirit of despondency that is whispering in the ear of the believer that is causing some people to go passive and to go dormant and to go under and to put down service I come to rebuke and to challenge that spirit and to let you know that even though it may seem like you've passed your time the God we serve is the creator and author of time and if he has to reverse time to make the fire and the call come forth in your life that is what he will do if God has to turn the calendar upside down so that it will his will be manifested in your life that's what God will do if you have to go to the hospital bed and do an operation the prophetic word upon your life will not go under the Bible said not one jot or titter of the word of God will come to naught but heaven and earth will come away burn up and dry up but not one word but you've got to do it by working out. We leave Abraham and we come into our era. I'm trying to show you the power of one. We look at something spectacular that happened in our time. The Azusa Street Revival. If you are an apostolic, you should know that word. The Azusa Street Revival was a historic Pentecostal revival meeting that took place in Los Angeles, California. And it is uh, in the origin of Pentecostal movement. This is coming from uh, the Pentecostal archives. It was led by one man, uh, by William J. Seymour. Later on, Bartley Mann came into the picture. But William J. Seymour had a burning and a yearning for a revival. He was not satisfied with what was happening in Pentecost in his time. He said, God, there is more to the church than this. Is there anybody in under the sound of my voice who would join uh, brother William and said, there is more to the apostolic church than this. Oh, God, I feel like I'm by myself. Is there anybody in here who will say like Mr. Seymour, there is more to the church than a shake and a holler. Is there anybody under the sound of my voice who will say there is more to the church than a choir and some fine musicians there is more to the church than some nice seats and some carpet on the ground there is more to the church than some people dressing nice and coming into the house on a Sunday morning I believe the fivefold ministry was given to the church I feel like preaching already I believe the fivefold ministry was given to the church so that when 
the sick come on up in the church fear is enough power and if it takes one man to say the devil is a liar come here with your crippled foot the blood of Jesus is against this crippleness that is inside of you I rebuke the spirit of witheredness I'm hungry for one man who will work out his own salvation that God will move upon you there is more to the church than Sunday morning there is more to the church than Saturday morning you better be there you better be here there's more to the church than Tuesday evening Paul in his writing said when corporate worship is over what do you do when you're at home when corporate worship is over when we get to playing the music when we get to running the eyes what do you do at the one-on-one -on -one level i'm trying to tell you that god is waiting on some of us to become radical in our spirits and say if my mama won't come i'm going to burn with fire for god if the whole team won't show up i'm gonna be here i love the numbers i love the company of the saints but I found out in the text in the Bible that God is waiting upon one man to get the fire going. I believe God is getting ready to do a revival in the earth. But too many of us are waiting and Sister X, Bishop Y and Pastor D. How about you? You said you went to a Pentecostal altar. You said you were baptized. You say you got the fire. Well, is your fire limited to peeking in tongues and running the aisle? How about walking up in the devil's camp and said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. You can't have my joy. You can't have my family. You can't have my wife. You can't have my husband. You can't have my kid. Wrong address. The blood of Jesus. But it's time to work out. It's time to work out. It's time to work out. Somebody look at your neighbor and said, it's time to work out. Paul now who have accomplished much in his ministry. Paul who would have wrought many miracles in his lifetime. Paul who was hailed as one of the greatest apostles. He wrote most of the New Testament epistles. Paul, they call it the Pauline letters. Paul ministered to some territories that he never even set foot. I don't know how to tell you this, but God is waiting for one who would burn with fervor so much that it doesn't matter where you are or what circumstance you find yourself in. Even if you have to write it, Lord God Almighty. Even if you have to send a WhatsApp message to tell somebody that you are the blessed and call of the Lord, I encourage you in the name of Jesus. Don't throw in the towels. Write like Paul. Send a text message. Send an email, Lord God Almighty. And so Paul Paul got to a place in his walk with God he would have seen mass revel revelation he would have seen mass gatherings he would have seen oh mass revival but Paul came to a place where he said I want to be careful that when I would have preached others into the kingdom I myself become a castaway what was Paul doing Paul was doing an analysis as it relates to his soul's salvation and Paul got to a place now where he said I want to be careful sister that when I would have witnessed when I would have hit the streets with the hospital ministry and you should go you better go when I would have handed out the tracks when I would have prayed when I would have entered the prayer room on a Wednesday I want to be careful that my soul is anchored in Jesus I come to tell the church I come to challenge you this morning you better enjoy the company of the saints but what do you do when you have to fight your own demons and your own devils by yourself you're living dangerously if you're dependent upon the crowd you're living dangerously if you're dependent upon brother Mark's voice you're living dangerously if you're waiting for Deacon Pinnock to lay hands on you, you better embrace the one, the one, the one. And Paul said, I've got to work out my own salvation with fear and trembling. One. So I've got to work out. Yeah. I've 
I've got to stretch my muscles. Yeah, yeah, I've got what I'm trying to say. I've got to grow in God so that I can handle when the Lord God Almighty. It's time to work out. You've got to get those biceps and those triceps stretched. Yeah, you've got to develop some resistance. Hold on a minute, brother. I just used the word resistance. What do you think is happening? Call back Mr. Newton. I need his help here. He's a physicist and a, a scientist. The weight is not comfortable in his hand. Watch this. And every time he lifts it, uh, let me try something out here, brother. Hold on, let me check the back. All right. How much pound is this? 30 pounds. The weight is all right, baby. I'm good. The weight in the hand is pulling my hand down. 30 pounds. When you work out, you are pushing up against the weight, the resistance. Hurry up and take this. Praise God. You're pushing up against, it's some resistance you're pushing up against. In our lives, there are some things we've got to push against. Put it down in the meantime. There are some things we've got to resist. I'm preaching to myself right now. I'll leave you alone. I don't know about you, which world you live in. But brother minister, there are some things I've got to resist and fight against. Can I get a witness? If I'm going to stay safe. There are some hard decisions that I've got to make. Why? Because I'm working out. I'm working out. I'm stretching my spiritual muscles. Brother preacher, I hear you talking. But how do I work out my own salvation? I don't have time to tell you all of this this morning but I'm just trying to get you to understand that your soul salvation comes down to one it begins with one and on the final analysis it's going to come down to one can I tell you and just run to the back end you are going to make it into heaven you are going to hear the sound of the trumpet on an individual level all right, preacher, uh-uh, you're off, preacher. The Bible said the dead in Christ shall rise. It's going to be a whole heap of dead rising. When God blow the trumpet, yes, but each individual who died in Christ, you're going to hear and you're going to rise. When you get up there, the Bible said there's going to be a book and another book. And whosoever's name is not found written in the Lamb's book of life. Salvation is an individual thing. The propagation of the gospel let me slow down the propagation of the gospel and evangelism in the earth and corporate worship yes it takes the crowd it's the body of Christ but when it comes down to your soul salvation and you crossing and missing hell and making it into heaven it is an individual thing sit here with your nice self and tell me about I want to serve the Lord but my boyfriend let me tell you something girl you must be crazy is which boy worth your soul on the final analysis God is going to hold you and you alone accountable for what you did with your soul I want to serve the Lord but my husband may I wait till he settle down I feel like talking to some unbelievers in the house you're in the right place at the right time God said to tell you you better wake up and smell the coffee I just told you the world is becoming smaller right now mr. Putin is threatening nuclear war on the world I'm trying to tell you that the Bible is fulfilling and you're sitting here with your nice powdered self talking about your boyfriend if I were you I would run to this altar and beg the church to baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ corporate worship is good Corporate evangelism is good. Corporate ministry is good. It is potent to in scripture. But when it comes down to your soul salvation, Paul said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Preacher, how do I work out my own salvation? There are some things you've got to do. Some things you've got to do. Watch this. Working out means stretching your spiritual muscles. Even when it pains. Even when it pains. You look at those who are fit. I, I wish Andre was here. 
I turned him into a model this morning. But Andre, he, that's what, that's, he just loves to exercise and it shows on him. Amen. Andre Pam. Good example. I borrowed this from him as a matter of fact. It's a good thing. I encourage everybody. Get in the gym. Find something at your house. It's good for your health. Amen. But, but when a bodybuilder or an athlete is training in their discipline, there's a program that they have. They have a coach and there is a program that they work with. The program for the 100 meter sprinter is not the same program for the 800 runner. Do I have an athlete in the house? Where's my sister? Where's my sister? Lord, oh my God. Stand up, sis. Stand and wave your hand. There she is, Geneva Russell. Praise God. Good to have you. She'll tell you, she doesn't have a 100 meter program. It's different. The kind of weight. You look at those 100 meter runners. Resistance. There is a weight that is strapped to their bodies. That when they get down, They need a pushing power to get them out of the blocks as they run their race. Is there anybody getting ready to get out of the blocks? You've been in the blocks too long, the Holy Ghost said. It's time to get out of the blocks. When they are on their mat, when they are training, there is a weight that is strapped to their bodies. And they have to be running and pulling that weight on the shoulder, resistance on the legs, so that you can develop muscle power that would give you a bullet start out of the blocks and get you through the different phases of the race. The 400 runner, the, the, the 800 runner, the distance runner may not use that because they don't need that starting power. Everybody have their own. In this race, we have some who are evangelists, some who are missionaries, some who are XYZ. We have different unique programs. But at the end of the day, you need some muscle power. Every one of them have to train. And when they are training, it pains. Go ask her. But you've got to stretch those muscles. Develop some resistance. I want it, but I have to resist. Sin is sweet. Did you know that? And sin say, come on back down here. Lift up your dumbbell there again, brother. Yeah, this is what sin does. This is what world and the pleasures of the world are. It's, it's down here. It wants you to come down. Go up, brother. You're trying to live for God, but the resistance. Keep working. Keep working. You'll thank me for this after that. Keep working, brother. Yeah, yeah. But see, he's feeling, and you can see the contraction of the muscle. This is what it is in our walk with God. We want to stay up in God. But sin is trying to pull us down. And this is how we are sometimes. Today I'm up. Tomorrow I'm down. Today I, uh -huh, I'm up. Tomorrow I'm down. Resistance. Put it down. You and I, if we are going to work out our own salvation, we have to say, look in your own life. What are the things I struggle with? Don't try to figure out what Elder Dawkins is struggling with. None of your business. Don't try to find out what Mark Reed is struggling with. None of your business. The Bible said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling because I'm working out I must change my diet there are some things that I can't consume simply because I'm working out I can't drink so much of the Johnny Walker because I'm working out I can't eat certain things because I'm working out there are some places I dare not go because I'm working out yeah 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 yeah, yeah. the invitation is calling me it wants to bring me down but because I'm working out I say for God I live and for God I die sin wants me here but God wants me here the crowd wants me here but God wants me here for God I live and for God I die I've made my choice forever just to walk with Christ my Lord not from him my soul just while I'm trusting in his words you've got to work those muscles yes working out involves an appreciation for resistance not everybody gonna love you 
I'm sorry for you if at this stage of your life your walk with God is dependent and everybody coming to rub your head and tell you how nice you are I love you with the love of the Lord we should embrace love in the house we should seek after each other when one cry all should cry when one laugh all should laugh when one receive a key the whole church should get excited but in the final analysis if you are dependent upon somebody holding your hand and telling you how nice you are you're living dangerously the Bible said work out your own salvation when you're working out you're gonna come up on opposition when you're working out they're gonna tell you don't go to training today oh let's go to Starbucks but Jenny will tell you there are some things that I would like to eat but I have my focus on my race I have my focus on my event I've got to go to the strap meet and I've got to win is there anybody in Emmanuel this morning who would say I've got to win and that's why I have to work out friends will leave me families will leave me but I've got to work out my own salvation I come to church and the sister not sitting beside me anymore but I've got to work out uh, my own salvation. The sister passed me. Five of us were standing. And she said, hello, apparently. Emphasis on the word, apparently. She said, hello to all four. And did not call my name. I'm not going back down there. Oh, only hypocrites go to Emmanuel. I say to you, true. And we have room for a few more like you. Hear me, somebody. You've got to work out your own salvation how do I do this preach I'm getting ready to leave you alone but you've got to develop some resistance you've got to know that when you're working out you've got to know that you must change your diet change the things you love can I tell you something I found out in my walk with God that this fallen Adamic nature that is still with every one of us the things that it loves most are the things that work against uh, our soul salvation can I tell you that the proclivities and the propensities that we have uh, work against our soul salvation that's why we have to work out uh, that's why we have to say God consume me with your fire that's why we have to say wash me Lord cleanse me Lord have thine own way Lord thou art the potter I am the clay mold me and make me after your will God if you leave it up to me I mess up the whole place if you leave it up to me I mess up the whole Jamaica there are some things in me that's not like you oh the preacher confessed this morning yes there are some things in me that's not like you Lord but take it out of me sit there and look at me I want to make heaven my home so I'm saying this morning I've got to work some things out I've got to stretch my muscles when you're working out your own salvation your service to God is personal when you're working out your own salvation your service to God is personal personal it's you and God you're on the committee but the role you play is between you and God. The committee will benefit, will level, leverage the strength of all of us. And by extension, the church will benefit. And by extension, the community will benefit. But when it comes down to your assignment and your soul salvation, your ministry on that committee is one-on-one -on -one personal. Too many believers are suffering from spiritual low self-esteem. Look how hard I worked. Look what I did for the church. And nobody called my name. I turned up and I was there by myself. Nobody called my name. Work out your own salvation. I've been here. I know when that brother got saved. And now he's a minister. Me know my Bible more than him. And then give minister. Work out your own salvation. 
final analysis, God is not going to call away to judgment ministers, elders, and bishops. He's going to call individuals. Can I talk to the church? Work out your own salvation. If mama won't come, it's between you and God. Boyfriend won't come, between you and God. Girlfriend won't come, between you and God. Prior partner won't come, between you and God. Work out your own salvation. Whatever area of ministry you're serving, don't get this twisted. One on one. One on one. It's time to work out, brethren. God is getting ready to take some people to another level, but he's waiting on you too. God is getting ready to manifest his power in an unprecedented way in individual's life, but he's waiting on you. God is getting ready to restore the years that some of you have sown in tears, but he's waiting on you. God is getting ready to shift some things in your life and bring about a 360 degree turnaround, but he's waiting on you. God is getting ready to blow the mind of your doctor. The next time you go back, the doctor is said, where have you been? Because that which I'm seeing now is not like what I saw the last time. But God is waiting on you. Stand to your feet all over this room. It's time to work out. It's time to go to another level in God. But you've got to stretch those muscles. You've got to stretch those biceps. You've got to stretch those muscles in your legs. You've got to stretch those chest muscles. You've got to put some resistance on your abdomen. You need that six pack in the spirit, but you've got to work out. Lord God Almighty, I've got to leave some things behind. Those things which I had, I come them but loss for the excellency I'm going forward but God is saying is there anybody ready to go higher is there anybody in here who want to see corporate revival anybody want to turn Jamaica upside down for God these are the days when the hearts of men are becoming desperately wicked we are seeing more murders in our school than we have ever seen before. God is waiting on some of us. Young and old, I'm talking to you. Students, young people, God is waiting on you. So that when you set foot in that college, that young man who has an evil intention, because you are there, Lord God Almighty. It seems like I'm talking monkey story this morning. You should control your territory. When you walk up in, you take. Because you are there. The devil has got to hold his peace. But God is waiting on you. On your street. I don't care how bad the lane is. I don't care what is the track record of the big man on the lane. No big man in the streets of Kingston big like God. Hear me somebody. But God is waiting on us to stop focus on corporate and get down on our knees and say, God, if it means me, I want you to anoint me in such a way that my very presence will make a difference. God wants to change your workplace spiritual wickedness in high places if some of you could see through the eyes of the spirit the kind of spirit that hangs over your workplace uh, you would tremble but God is not calling us to fear God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind but God is saying you can conquer and rule but you've got to work out your own salvation Lift your hands in the presence of the Lord. We're asking God to let the anointing fall on us afresh. Let the anointing fall in such a way that at the individual level, we will burn with fervent fire.
so that we don't have to announce revival revival will be automatic elder when each of us at the individual level come on everybody engage 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 come on as an act of faith come on let's do this We're working out we're working out we're not leaving here unfit today we're not leaving here unfit we're leaving with the fervor we're leaving with a with a spirit of catalyst who will change yes we're working out we're working out we're working out yeah we feel the pain yes we feel the pain but that's our muscle growing and hear this we need the anointing to fall on us afresh a part of the working out process it involves a lot of things but this one, and, and I'm closing, this one seems ironic. You have to eat right, you have to exercise, you have to engage in strenuous activities. But a critical part of the working out process is rest. Yeah, you will work yourself to death. A critical part of the working out process is rest. How do I rest spiritually? Because preacher, you just tell me to get on fire and work. There are some things that we worry about and carry on our minds. And trying to fix some things in our lives. Trying to fix some things even in the church. You know what God said? As part of the working out process, rest in God. This is my church. I'll fix what I need to fix in due season. You at the individual level belong to me. There are some things that you worry about. Leave, rest in God. I'll fix this. I got this, God said. I got, I got this. I got this. Rest. So I encourage those of us who are worried and overly concerned about some issues. As you work out, remember there comes a point where you must drink enough liquid and a man who knows his God will rest in God the story is told of a young man who was on a ship the sea there was a storm and the sea becomes boisterous everybody they, they felt like they're all dead now and they found a young man relax kick back smiling in a corner and they said this guy must be mad youngster how can you be so relaxed on this ship we are about to drown we are about to die the young man said my daddy is the pilot that went over some of your head what the young man was saying I don't care what's happening right here I know my daddy He's seen this before. All his life he's doing this. I trust my daddy. So I'll rest. That's what we need to do. As we work out our own salvation. As we read the scriptures more. As we study the word of God more. As we develop an appetite for the things of God. As we develop an appetite for prayer. As we develop an appetite for consecration. As we develop an appetite for the teaching of the word of God. As we stretch our muscles and we resist the devil. There comes a point when we must just rest in God. Leave it to God. He'll fight your battle. We need the anointing. Anybody need the anointing? He is going to manifest in your life as you make the commitment to work out. As you make the commitment to work out. <clears throat> God is in this place and he's, he's pouring out his anointing even now. He's pouring out his anointing even now. We need the anointing. We need the power of the anointing to resist. It's not by might. But by the spirit, we can't fight this battle on all. We need God. We need God. Let the power of the Holy Ghost fall on me. Some of us, we've come to a place of passiveness. We've come to a place where I, I feel churched out. I don't feel like I can do this. I go when I feel like going and when I don't feel like going, I don't go. Nobody don't bother me. You have lost the fervor. But God is saying to you this morning, you're in this house. And I'm here to remind you. That you've got to work out your own salvation. 
I don't like what's going on. I don't like how that is going on. You've got to work out your own salvation. So we need the fire of the Holy Ghost to bring us back to that place of service where we are burning for God. And if it means I've got to do it by myself because I'm not doing it for accolades and I'm not here to serve when the big lights are on. That's corporate. But I show you in the text, corporate, one, balance. I'm not here to serve when the cameras are up. I'm not here to serve when, when, when everybody can see me. I need the anointing that will make me serve even in the garbage bin. I'll serve. Found myself in a cemetery the other day. In the boiling sun. I wasn't even supposed to be there. The Holy Ghost would so move upon me that I found time to minister to a young man right there in the cemetery. Everybody pack up and gone. And I'm running late to go pick up my wife. But I found time to minister to this. If I didn't tell you, you would know. This is one out of the many. I'm not trying to blow a trumpet because I'm sure I'm not the only one who operates like this. I'm just trying to say, if you're serving when the lights are on, I double dare say to you that that's a spirit of hypocrisy. Disfigure your faces in the streets. Isn't that what Jesus said? For everybody to know that you're fasting. Bible said when you pray, go into your closet. Jesus was not against public worship. The lesson he was trying to teach is the importance of the one-on-one -on -one with God. So I call on every believer this morning. Ask God genuinely to let the fire of the Holy Ghost fall on you. So that you will burn again. And you will not miss the importance of one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. As the anointing fall on us right now. Stand with me all over this room. Don't get weary now. We're singing this as a prayer. Anointing. Real prayerfully. Fall. Please let the anointing set me free. Let the power of the power of the Holy Let it fall on me. Let the anointing fall, Jesus. As you hum that real, real, real low. Is there one in the house? You've heard the word of the Lord. You know you have a soul to be saved. You and God now. Don't look around, don't look for your friends, don't look who's going to look at you. You know you're not in right standing with God, you know you're not saved. I invite you to come, come to Jesus. Is there one that will give your life to the Lord and say, today I want to be baptized. Today I want somebody to pray for me as I struggle with my walk with God. Is there one to be baptized today? I invite you to come. I invite you to come.